Hey, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, welcome, church family. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for tuning in with us. You know, one reason the Lord always tells us to be strong and courageous in the Bible is because he has bigger plans for you than you're comfortable with. So may we ever be strong and courageous. Amen? Amen. Would you turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. Hannah and I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today. As we're approaching the holiday season, we'd love to provide you uplifting resources that will both encourage you in your relationships and with your loved ones, and more importantly, in your relationship with God. I love what the holiday season represents, and it's such a special time as we gather with family and friends, whether to celebrate old traditions or to start new ones of your own. But this season can also be a time where many of you feel lonely and are needing God to come through in an amazing way in your life. I just wanna encourage you today that God's very name, Emmanuel, literally means God is with us. Know that he sees you exactly where you are and he is with you this season. And our prayer is that you'll experience God's amazing and transforming love in ways you never have before. All of us here at the Hour of Power love you and we're here for you. So you can call anytime the toll-free number on your screen or log into our website today to request the special offers we've prepared for you. They really will make a difference in your life. Thanks again for joining us. And I also want to just give a special thank you to our friends and partners for your incredible ongoing support. And remember always, God loves you and so do we. Hey, we have an awesome day today. We have Alex Boyer in the house. Yeah. He's going to be leading us with helping us in worship. And uh, we have uh, Katie Davis Majors here to give our morning sermon, yes. which is awesome. Woo! Heard her preach in the last service, and she has such a great story, and uh, she's going to be sharing the word with us this morning. And hey, we just want you to know we are so thrilled you're here today. We've had, a, obviously, a, a rough week with the shooting in Las Vegas, and these shootings that keep happening, and, and uh, also yesterday we had the memorial service for uh, Billy Sovich, a member of our choir who passed away a couple weeks ago, a young guy, and so it's, it's been, a, I think, a rough week for a lot of us, but we're just so thrilled today. We just believe we're going to leave here encouraged, full of the, the hope and life in Jesus Christ that's made available to every single person who puts their hope in him, amen? We're going to leave here with fresh vision, joy, life. And uh, so we're so glad you're here. We don't think it's an accident that you're here. We think that the Holy Spirit uh, wanted you to be here and is going to leave with you and encourage you and, and uh, fill you with everything that you need to, to have an awesome week. Sunday's the first day of the week, right? Not the last. So we begin our week in worship. So Lord, we thank you and we love you. And we ask in Jesus' name, I just pray that you would rain down, open heaven and rain down blessing, joy, fullness, peace, uh, vision, now, anybody who's coming today who struggles with anxiety or depression, Lord, I thank you break those chains. Lord, you, you fill us with everything that is of and from Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord. We trust you. We come here to worship his name. Amen. Amen. Preparation for Katie's message, the words of our Lord found in Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. 
sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. We, church family, are courageously trusting God's plans. Amen.
Katie, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We're overjoyed today. Yeah. Yeah, gosh, we are just so overjoyed to have Katie Davis Majors in the house with us today. She's going to be sharing our morning's message. But before that, I just wanted to kind of like talk to her about her new book. She uh, is an impactful, inspiring young woman who's radically made a difference uh, for over a decade, um, serving the Lord and your children and your community in Uganda. So would you please welcome with me Katie Davis Majors. Hi, Katie. Thank you. Good to see you. Hi, good to Glad see you're you. here. Thank you. So, you know, you sold a lot of your copies of your book. I think almost everyone in our family read Kisses from Katie, which was your last book. You, I think you wrote maybe eight years ago or something. Yeah. And, um, but a lot of people don't know your story. So let's, let's just start with the fact that you have 14 kids. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so tell me about that. How did you get 14 kids? Well, our 13 oldest are adopted. And so they have come to me over the last many years. Um, most of them are sibling groups of two or three. And they're children who, for various reasons, were not able to stay with their biological families or maybe didn't have biological families. And so mm -hmm. I began the process to adopt them yeah. several years ago. And then recently, we just welcomed our first biological son as well. Awesome. So you recently were married, and uh, and you had your so you have all daughters, adopted all daughters, yes. and then had like a boy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's be our spoiled one rotten. little boy, and he he is <laughs> what he's a treasure, very loved. So, but but a lot of people don't understand. Like you were just eight. I mean, you're only 28 now. You're still very young. I mean, you moved out to Africa to Uganda when you were 18. You just That's pick right. up to, picked up and went. And your original plan was to stay like for a month or something, right? Well, yeah, I had been there for three weeks, and then I decided to go back and committed to be there for a year to teach yeah. in an orphanage. And long story short, the year turned into two and three and Total ten. Yeah. I'm sure your parents were thrilled. And, uh, <laughs> but I mean, I, 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 all joking aside, I'm sure that they feel so um, proud of you for, for what you've done, and they should. I mean, what you're doing is great, and I know you don't look at it that way. It's your family. You just love your kids. But but um, Daring to Hope is sort of a follow-up to what's been happening over the last 10 years. Obviously, you married. You had your own biological kid. And uh, let's just talk about that. Your new book is called Daring to Hope. And uh, why did you write it? What's it about? Daring to Hope chronicles the stories of many people who have come to live with us over the years. So we're blessed to have our house set up and that we have a pretty simple guest room outside of our house. And so we've been able to welcome in different people who are struggling or suffering with illness. And they've just taught me a lot about God and learning to see his goodness, even when the people we serve are really suffering. So Daring to Hope chronicles that and even kind of my wrestle with who is God in the midst of suffering and hardship. Totally. I imagine you must have, because of the success of your last book, you probably have Americans and other Westerners that come down to Uganda and just want to see what you're doing. I'm sure it happens all the time. Sure, too, right? yeah. So a big part of your book is the tragedy that, I mean, you've gone through lots of tragedies, but you kind of start with one in particular. Tell us about that. Yeah, so the book kind of opens up with the story of my little girl, Jane. She was a little girl we had been fostering for about three years, and we had had other short-term foster children, but it's different when you know on the front end that it's going to be short-term. Yeah. For Jane, we had searched for her biological family, and we hadn't found anyone, so I had actually begun to make her adoption legal. And in the midst of that process, her biological mother found us and decided that she wanted to parent Jane. So that was, of course, a huge loss for me and a huge loss even for the rest of our family. And I, I really prayed for that first little while that God would somehow mm -hmm. make it so that she could come back and live with us and be a part of our family. And um, so I, you know, I wrestled when God didn't answer that prayer the way that I was asking. I, yeah. I really wrestled with, okay, God, how can you be good and loving when you're, you're not giving me what I want. And yeah. I think he just, he really taught me to trust him and he really proved himself to be true in that time. And I, th I think what a lot of people don't understand is when you adopt a child, they really are yours, just like you gave birth to them yourself. So you've had this kid for three years. Yes. You're already gonna adopt, she's your daughter in your mind, in your heart, you, you love her, mm -hmm. she belongs at this home. And then, you know, her biological mom comes and I'm sure there was a part of that that maybe that's Maybe that's good. I don't know anything about the biological one, but then there's part of you like, this is my daughter now, and you're, it's painful. It's like it's like it's like a, a kind of death almost that mm -hmm. you have. Not that she died, but that she's being like cut out from. I just imagine it would be incredibly painful. Yeah, it was very difficult. 
So a big part of a big part of your message then and what you learned through this is just kind of the idea and the importance of surrender and the courage to surrender and trust God's plan. Absolutely. I really feel like I've seen through that situation and many other situations over the years that God's plan truly is better. Uh, yeah. He does have more for us than what we think. Even when I first moved to Uganda, I had no intention of starting a big ministry or having a big family. But yeah. as I turned my plans over to his, he, he gives us what we need. Yeah, that's right. He always does. And it's really true that his plans, it's not like they're better just in the sense of like, it's holy or something, but like, it's gonna be better for me. To, yes. Just like he's a loving dad. And like when we're kids, we don't always think what our parents want for us is the best, but as we become adults ourselves, oftentimes we look back and we go, oh yeah, they were good yeah. to be, you know? And that's, that's how it is with the Lord. We, we can trust him, right? I mean, Absolutely. There's millions of people watching around. There's a lot of people here in the church today. What, as, before, I know you have a sermon, but are there any other words of encouragement you just sort of have to offer to those who are here? Yeah, I would, I would just encourage people that I think I can say personally that I knew Jesus in, in a deeper way mm -hmm. through my suffering and my hardship than I ever would have known him had yeah. I not been through those things. And yeah. so I'd like to encourage anybody who is struggling, and we're all struggling with something, right? Yeah. Suffering yeah. is in our face yeah. world That's over. Right. Um, and I, I just think that Jesus, he longs to comfort us yep. in that. And so I would encourage people that he is with you. That's great. Thank you, Katie. Well, Katie will be outside and she'll be happy to sign your books and take pictures with you and say hello and answer your questions. And, and, uh, but what an honor it is that in this short trip out to the States that you're willing to come to our church and minister to us. So we're just so thankful. Thank, Thank you, you, Katie. Let's give her a hand. Thank, Thank you. you. Love you. Appreciate you.
Hi friends, we are in a message series on our thoughts and the ways in which we not only limit ourselves but our neighbors by saying negative things like, I'm not smart enough, or that can't happen, or I'm too young or too old. I'm so passionate about helping you focus on your thoughts and connecting with God that I've asked our team to put together these two-sided inspirational thought cards. Yes, everything begins and ends with our thoughts. In our busy, noisy, day-to-day -day lives, we often don't pay attention to what we're paying attention to. No. We don't think about what we're thinking about. These cards have positive, uplifting phrases to help you throughout your day. Yeah, that's right. Phrases like, courage begins with a single step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of, or a grateful heart is a magnet for miracles. And an extraordinary life requires extraordinary courage. During this message series, we will see how the ways in which we've limited ourselves through thinking has gotten us to where we are and how we can change our thinking to inherit our destiny. Let's change our thoughts and change the world. I encourage you to start each day with Jesus and focus on things that will change your mind for Him. Please call, write, or go online today and request the special six-pack of two-sided inspirational thought cards with quotes from Bobby, we hope these cards remind you how much we love and appreciate having you as part of our community. As we move into fall and begin preparations for the upcoming holiday season, here at the Hour of Power in Shepherd's Grove, we want to also help prepare your hearts and your minds for the season of Advent. You know, Advent is a time of waiting and a time of hope. It's a time of believing that in the milieu of life, all the challenges and suffering that we face, somehow God is going to break through. This Christmas season, we want to help you detach from all your to-do list and rest in the peace of Jesus Christ. So we put together this pocket-sized Advent reading plan designed to help you as you prepare for Christmas. Like preparing for a party, Advent is a time of preparing our heart and soul for Christmas. And the best way to do that is to spend time in God's Word. Yeah, this booklet includes scriptures, short devotions, prayers, and reflections to guide you through the 25 days that lead up to Christmas. You know, all of us go through things in life, and Advent is that season where we go, okay, no matter what's going on around me during the season, I'm going to fill my heart with hope, not despair, and believe in my future in Jesus Christ. Spend a few minutes each day with this booklet and tune out all the busyness of the holiday season. Our prayer is that this reading plan will help you in your walk with God during this special season of waiting. Please call, write, or go online today and request this Advent reading plan. We hope it reminds you how much we love and appreciate having you as a part of our ministry. Thank you and remember always, God loves you and so do we. Stars that shine at night to light your 
hands up, hands up, and celebrate. Why you celebrate if you give love the universe will find a way to change your thing and it's okay we're still breathing and that's the reason why we Before we introduce our, our guest speaker today, we're going to stand together and say this confession. Would you stand with me? Hold your hands out like this is a sign of receiving. We're going to line our hearts and minds with the word of God. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Well, our guest really needs no introduction. You've heard her in the interview already. She's a dynamic thinker, speaker, but is also doing an awesome work in Uganda. Would you please welcome with me Katie Davis Majors. Thank you. I thought I was courageous once. At 18 years old, I decided to move across the ocean to a little village in East Africa with a suitcase full of construction paper and crayons and a heart determined to change the world for the gospel of Christ. I was bright-eyed and unwavering, full of a naive optimism that I had called hope and a bit of a silly boldness that I had labeled courage. And you know, I, I laugh and shake my head a bit at the spirited young girl I once was, so determined. But I have to admit, I admire that teenage girl's willingness to just go, just do, just love people. I didn't think about what other people thought I wasn't paralyzed by what I could or should be doing. I just did. When the spirit nudged, I just went. And I have to admit that God used me even in my naivety. That was 10 years ago. Slowly, quietly, Jesus has taken my optimism and he has replaced it with a true hope. Not a hope that looks for a happy ending. Not a hope that trusts in him only when things go as planned. But a hope that clings only to him, regardless of the situation or the outcome. He has taken my willful determination and replaced it with something that I think more closely resembles true courage. A courage that can only be found in him. I didn't know then, when I packed my bags and boarded a plane full of answers and excitement, I didn't know just how many answers I really didn't have. I showed up that first day to teach kindergarten, having been told that I would be teaching around 20 students, having packed and prepared perfectly for those 20 students. And 138 pairs of eyes looked back at me, <laughs> eager to learn, 
expectant. Our classroom was a barn, and it smelled like a barn. And they had packed as many precious children into that barn as they possibly could for the privilege of an education. None of them spoke a word of English. I would grab an object and hold it in front of me and say, this is a ball. And they would repeat it back, this is a ball. And I'd say it again, this is a ball. And they'd repeat it again, this is a ball. And then later I'd grab a pencil and they'd all say, this is a ball. <laughs> Not quite what I expected. As the days wore on, I became overwhelmed with the needs that I saw day after day. Children would come to school hungry, their bellies distended from malnutrition, the life draining from their eyes. Children would come to school sick with high fevers, dirty from walking miles and miles for the privilege to learn. I would see the desperation, the hopelessness of living day after day in immense poverty and my heart cried out, we have to give these people hope. We must give them Jesus. I ran hard and fast for him, with him, I made plans for how I would help, all I would do. And he taught me something. He didn't need me. It was I who needed him. I trusted that God was who he said he was. And I was ambitious, to say the least. Over the next year, God grew my ministry and he grew my family, but more than that, he grew in me surrender. The laying down of all my plans and my dreams and opening my hands to his. I didn't know the beauty that would find me in a life poured out for him. I didn't know the joy of calling a little one daughter and pressing into him to know what true courage really meant. I didn't know the exhilaration of worshiping in a room full of people crying out to one God in many different languages. I didn't know the thrill of witnessing a life changed due to basic, simple provision like food or medicine. I didn't know the pain that awaited me on the other side of the ocean, on the other side of humility, where I realized just how little I had to offer. I didn't know that I would call a little girl daughter for years, that she would call me mommy, and then she would be taken away from me. I didn't know that I would carry the responsibility of looking into a mother's face and telling her, that her child was not going to live. I didn't know that I would forge deep friendships with people imprisoned by addictions that I could not help them fight no matter how I tried. I did not know that I would care for people for months at a time living with HIV, that I would beg and plead for God to save them and that I would end up holding their hands as they slipped into eternity with him on the other side. And I did not know that in the middle of such pain and grief and loss, I would experience a joy and a peace that far surpassed human understanding. The Lord would take the darkest, most difficult places of my life, and he would make them the places where I knew him more intimately than I ever fathomed possible. In the midst of a hurricane of pain that surrounded me, I would experience a true comfort so deep, so real, 
that it simply could not be denied. It was Jesus. He was near. He was near to me. When God didn't give me what I wanted, he gave me something else. He gave me something better. He gave me himself. And this gave me courage. Your life is probably a little different than mine. I get to carry this title of ministry leader, but really I have an amazing staff of wonderful, Jesus-loving people who run the day-to-day of our ministry. I'm mostly just a stay-at-home mom, so I fold laundry as my profession. (laughs) I make dinner and help with homework and mediate sibling rivalries, and you know the drill. I've asked myself a lot over the last 10 years, what is courage. And God has brought to mind the story of Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. I can hardly read this story without weeping. And I wanted to share part of it with you today. Genesis starts by saying that God tested Abraham. God said to him, Abraham, here I am. Abraham replied, Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Take him to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering to me in the place where I will show you. Genesis says that early the next morning, Abraham got up and he loaded up his donkey. Can you imagine? There doesn't seem to be any argument here. He just loaded up his donkey. I don't know about you, but I am certainly not quick to respond like Abraham did. When God asks something of me, I especially wouldn't be if he was asking me to surrender my kid. Can you imagine the pain the confusion of Abraham as he loads his donkey with the firewood, as he treks up that mountain next to his beloved son. This is the son that God had promised him. This is the son that Abraham had waited for for years. God has promised to make Abraham the father of a great nation through this Son, and now, would he take him away? And faithfully, courageously, Abraham loads up his donkey and he heads up that mountain. His courage is in his surrender. Have you ever been there? looking at your own plans, the things that you thought God had promised you, and just wondering, why? Why this way, Lord? How? How can you ask this of me? I don't know about you, but I'm slow to respond like Abraham. I reason and I plead And I argue with God, telling him about my way and my plan and all that I am going to accomplish if he just gives me what I want. Do you wish that you had Abraham's blind and crazy trust, this resolute courage? Me too. I can envision Isaac plodding along next to his father. It says the firewood was on his back. Genesis says that Abraham carried the knife and the fire, and I wondered if he trembled with the unknown, with the weight of all that God had asked him to do. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. Father, the fire and the wood are here, said Isaac. 
But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? My son, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And I just, I can't get over Abraham's certainty. It's a bold claim to make when you can't see it yet. He's so sure God will provide the lamb. And I wonder, do I believe this? That whatever the mountain is, no matter how steep or seemingly hopeless, though the pebbles slip under our feet as we trudge onward, God will provide that no matter what I've been asked to sacrifice, no matter what dreams he's calling me to lay down, what plans I need to set aside, God will provide. God will provide the strength. God will provide the grace. God will provide the way. That's courage, isn't it? To look up at our mountains, whatever they are, and to trust him. To know that whatever he is asking us, to lay down or set aside. We can because he will be enough. He will provide himself. There is great courage in surrender. You know how the rest of the story goes, right? Abraham builds the altar. He piles it with wood and he ties his son Isaac there. He reaches out his hand to slay his own son. And at that very moment, a voice from heaven calls out to him, instructing him to lay aside his knife. Genesis reads, and Abraham looked, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. A ram. And we know something that Abraham didn't know yet. Not only did God provide a ram, but he provided the lamb. Not only did God spare Abraham's son, but he sent his son. He spared us too. And if he would indeed give his very own son, our lamb in the thicket, hung on the cross as an offering in place of you and me, then certainly we can trust him to give us what we need here now. Certainly we can surrender our wills, our plans, our dreams to his in place of our certain death. He gave his son, and so we can trust him to give us what we need here, too. You know, Jesus, he set aside all my original plans for how I was going to change lives and communities in Uganda. He's used that place to change and to shape me. I share with them so little, and they share with me wisdom and joy and laughter. They let me sit with them and listen to their stories and their wisdom. They let me experience his goodness to them and his redemption in their painful circumstances. They embody genuine hospitality, even at the price of sacrifice. And they teach me what true gratitude looks like, even in the face of poverty. I have known God's goodness in new ways because I could lay down my own plans. You know, earlier in Genesis, long before Isaac came along, God had sent Abraham from his homeland And he said to Abraham, I'm sending you with a promise. I will make your name great, and I will bless you 
and you will be a blessing. I am your shield, God said. I am your very great reward. And I think that's the secret that Abraham knew as he climbed that mountain with his son. That is the secret that God has taught me in the darkest, most difficult places of my life. It wasn't making his name great that was Abraham's great reward. It wasn't the many descendants he would give Abraham or the vast amounts of land or even the son that he gave him in his old age. It was God himself, his very great reward. Do we believe this? That it isn't our fame or recognition. It isn't our success or our failure. No matter what great blessing God pours out on our lives, it isn't the greatest thing that he could give us. Because the greatest thing that he can give you and me, it's himself, our very great reward. And sometimes we feel like the one carrying the knife, climbing the mountain with our faces set against the wind, wondering all the long way why God would ask this of us or what he might possibly be doing. And we need to remember, God isn't promising us ease. He isn't promising us that life will go as planned. He isn't promising a world without trouble, without heartache along the way. He is promising us himself, Emmanuel, God with us, our only hope, our only courage. Do you remember how the story started? Genesis reads, God said to Abraham, Abraham, he called his name. And I want you to insert your name there for a minute. God has called each one of us to something. Some days it'll be big and some days it'll be small. But it will always take courage. And maybe courage isn't boldness or optimism. Maybe courage isn't the absence of fear, but looking at our fears and taking the next step anyway. The simplicity of Abraham's answer is so beautiful. Here I am, he said. He didn't recount his own plans to God. He didn't remind God of what God had previously promised to him. He didn't tell God that God was asking too much or that it was too hard. Here I am, he said. I want to ask you today, what is your Mount Moriah? Maybe it's your job or your ministry or your family and you feel like you've hit a wall, a climb so steep, and you're just tired, and you can't do it anymore. Or maybe your Mount Moriah is a relationship, a spouse or a child, a coworker, or even a stranger that you've been called to love, but they're hard to love, and it feels lonely on this mountain road trying to be faithful to what God has asked of you. What is God asking you to lay on the altar? Could it be that what he wants most is just your heart's surrender? You laying down your life and your plans and the opening of your hands to his? Could it be that he doesn't want your big plans or all that you can do for him? But what he really wants is you, just you. Maybe 
the greatest courage is to lay it all down. To look up our mountains and to tremble with fear, but to know that God's way is better. And ultimately, he will provide the very best. His son, the lamb. Let me pray for you guys. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you for your provision. I thank you for your son, Jesus. For his sacrifice in the place of each one of us. And Father, I thank you for each person in this room. And I just ask and I pray, Lord, that they would feel your great love for them. Father, that they would feel that you are their very great reward. Father, and I ask for each one of us that we would have a spirit of courageous surrender. Father, that we would hear your call to love you and to love others, Father, and that we would set aside anything that could get in the way of that, Lord, and just surrender to you. I thank you that you love us. We love you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Hi friends, we are in a message series on our thoughts and the ways in which we not only limit ourselves but our neighbors by saying negative things like, I'm not smart enough, or that can't happen, or I'm too young or too old. I'm so passionate about helping you focus on your thoughts and connecting with God that I've asked our team to put together these two-sided inspirational thought cards. Yes, everything begins and ends with our thoughts. In our busy, noisy, day-to-day -day lives, we often don't pay attention to what we're paying attention to. No. We don't think about what we're thinking about. These cards have positive, uplifting phrases to help you throughout your day. Yeah, that's right. Phrases like, courage begins with a single step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of, or a grateful heart is a magnet for miracles. And an extraordinary life requires extraordinary courage. During this message series, we will see how the ways in which we've limited ourselves through thinking has gotten us to where we are and how we can change our thinking to inherit our destiny. Let's change our thoughts and change the world. I encourage you to start each day with Jesus and focus on things that will change your mind for Him. Please call, write, or go online today and request the special six pack of two-sided inspirational thought cards with quotes from Bobby, we hope these cards remind you how much we love and appreciate having you as part of our community. As we move into fall and begin preparations for the upcoming holiday season, here at the Hour of Power in Shepherd's Grove, we want to also help prepare your hearts and your minds for the season of Advent. You know, Advent is a time of waiting and a time of hope. It's a time of believing that in the milieu of life, all the challenges and suffering that we face, somehow God is going to break through. This Christmas season, we want to help you detach from all your to-do list and rest in the peace of Jesus Christ. So we put together this pocket-sized Advent reading plan designed to help you as you prepare for Christmas. Like preparing for a party, Advent is a time of preparing our heart and soul for Christmas. And the best way to do that is to spend time in God's Word. Yeah, this booklet includes scriptures, short devotions, prayers, and reflections to guide you through the 25 days that lead up to Christmas. You know, all of us go through things in life, and Advent is that season where we go, okay, no matter what's going on around me during the season, I'm going to fill my heart with hope, not despair, and believe in my future in Jesus Christ. Spend a few minutes each day with this booklet and tune out all the busyness of the holiday season. Our prayer is that this reading plan will help you in your walk with God during this special season of waiting. Please call, write, or go online today and request this Advent reading plan. We hope it reminds you how much we love and appreciate having you as a part of our ministry. Thank you and remember always, God loves you and so do we.